Hello and welcome back to Calculus 1, section 2.6 on continuity. <coughs> All right, so continuity of functions. Um, the noob way to uh, define continuity would be to draw a function in a continuous stroke. And if you don't have to lift the pen, function is continuous. Why do I say noob? Because later on in mathematics, if you take advanced calculus and so on, you can define functions that you have to lift the pen to draw, but they are still continuous. So it doesn't really make sense to, to say draw the function in one, one stroke. But the... Um, the way uh, to uh, think of it is when, when you see a function already uh, uh, drawn, uh, if it's one continuous stroke, it's continuous. Uh, the surface of this desk is discontinuous at the edge. There is a, a drop. And hopefully you see that as you approach this edge, if you approach standing on a desk, right? When you get to the edge, you have a long way down. If you are approaching the edge from the floor, uh, there is again a big gap to go up. There is a dis disconnect in elevation at the edge of the desk. And that disconnect is called discontinuity. You definitely want your bridge to be continuous at all times. You definitely want your uh, train tracks or the roller coaster tracks to be continuous at all times. Right? <coughs> Depending on what kind of car you have, you also want the road to be continuous because we do have the off-road things, right, that you can drive. But then also, there is a continuous supply of power, continuous supply of cold air, so you can freeze to death in this classroom, as I can see people are going, right? Already shivering. Um, so continuity is a big deal, and, uh, and we need it. We need it in design, and we need it in our lives, so the lives are not interrupted by discontinuities. So now, um, we are going to define continuity at the point first, and then we're going to use that continuity to define continuity uh, globally. And then we can have fun with all different types of uh, uh, things. So to start off, um, I will uh, draw uh, two graphs. So one graph is just a parabola, right? Good old f of x equals x squared. And uh, this is a continuous graph. You don't see any breaks or interruptions in it. And uh, we say it's continuous. And then we can draw one over x graph, which will say discontinuous. And we see that that happens at x equals zero. That's where the discontinuity is. <coughs> so it's very easy to spot when you have a discontinuous graph. Now, let's go with the first definition, continuity at a point. Function f of x is set to be continuous at 
at point x equals a if and now we have three rules number one f of a exists number two limit of f of x exists as x goes to a and finally number three limit x equals to a of f of x is equal to f of a technically what we're saying is that one is equal to two So this is what you must learn. And then you test these three rules on a function that you have. That function can be trigonometric, exponential, uh, radical, it could be anything, it doesn't matter. Especially we are interested in piecewise functions because those are the ones at danger, right? So if I want to apply this, on function f of x equals x squared plus 1 at x equals to 3 I am asking if this is continuous at that point first off realize that x squared plus 1 has infinitely many points and I'm just picking one x equals 3 and I'm going to check continuity at that point so number one says that f of 3 must exist well that's 3 squared plus 1 which is 10 so yeah put a green check mark right there by now obviously you're bringing color pencils and you have green number two a limit of x squared plus 1 as x goes to 3 well, if this gets tough, you get to use the left limits, right limits, or graphs, or charts, or whatever witchcraft you can pull off to solve the limit. The question is, do we have an answer? Now, this is a very simple limit to solve because there is no denominator, there is no zero in denominator and all that, so we can just plug in and we will again get 10. So, yes, num rule number two holds. Rule number three simply asks if one is equal to two. And we do see that 10 is equal to 10. So rule number three holds. Uh, the answer to this question is, since all three rules hold, f of x equals x squared plus one is continuous. at x equals to 3. Guys, this is where you get your points. This sentence, which clearly states that you know there are three rules that you are supposed to check to find continuity. You want to have continuity. Just remember how annoying it is when you are talking on your cell phone while you're not supposed to talk on your cell phone and it goes tomorrow, right? That's discontinuities right there. <coughs> so now let's take a look at our favorite function, 1 over x. <laughs> f of x equals 1 over x. Uh, by the end of the, the calculus 1, we will beat this function to death. Because it's an amazing function. It, it, it applies almost everywhere, right? For, to be an example of some sort. And then you will continue to use it a lot in Calc 2. So we are wondering at the continuity at x equals 0. Well, 
out on a first strike. F of zero does not exist. Big fat e function f of x equals one over x is discontinuous discontinuous at x equals zero. It failed on the first bullet point. It's gone immediately. There's no reason to go and check second point and the third point because the first point failed. It's the same like you want to go somewhere, you can't find your car keys. The rest of the fact that you have a car, that there is gas, you know where you're going, it's all irrelevant. If you can't start the car, right, to go, or you don't know how to fix that issue, right? So, as you go through this one, two, three, it might the, the, the problem might check out on line one or line two or line three. You keep going until it checks out. If you get all three, then it's continuous. If one of them fails, it's done immediately. <coughs> now, I'm going to do this problem in red because uh, it's important. The function is f of x equals 1 over x, again, and the question is if it's continuous at x equals to 2. And I hope you will say yes, because f of 2 is 1 half. That checks out. Number two, the limit of 1 over x as x goes to 2 is also 1 half. Because you can plug in, right? There's no zero in the denominator or anything like that when you plug in 2. So it's all good. And finally, number three, 1 half equals to 1 half. That checks out. So yeah. Don't study examples. Never study examples. Because we have to make it clear that 1 over x is discontinuous function. But see, now I'm asking about continuity at the point, and that point is 2. So in this red example, yes, 1 over x is continuous at 2. If this continuous at 0, it's continuous at 2. So be very careful about that. <coughs> you must check three rules every time. Do not assume things in calculus. So, yes, 1 over x is continuous at x equals 2. Is this continuous at 0? So, this is it. You must learn the red. And then you must use the red on every problem that you get. <coughs> now, more interesting cases are when you have piecewise functions. Um, especially if you have issues with graphing and you don't know uh, whether the graph is going to connect or not to visually determine the continuity. Uh, use the three rules and it will work fine. So let's say that you have f of x to be piecewise function of x squared minus 1 for all x's smaller than 2. And let's say you have 3x plus 1 for all x is bigger or equal than 2. Is this continuous at x equals to 2? <coughs> so, 
So, let's do three rules. Number one, what is f of two? Well, f of two is happening on this line here because that's where x equals to two is. That's the domain on which two exists. So, the answer is three times two plus one equals seven. past point one. Number two, limit of f of x as x goes to two. <coughs> well, now you have to do left limit and right limit. Guys, this wise function will have Two pieces, piece like this, and maybe a piece like that. The place where they connect is that x equals to two. So approach from the left is smaller than an approach from the right. And then you have to use the theorem, which says if those numbers are the same, you have overall limit Woohoo! If the numbers are not the same, you don't have the limit. So to answer number two, I have to look at the limit x approaches two minus, and that will be x squared minus one, <coughs> which gives me three. Then limit x approaches two plus, that's from the right, which means I am on 3x plus 1, and that gives me 7. These two are not equal, which means that the overall limit of f of x does not exist. Therefore, it fails the second bullet point and we say function f of x is not continuous at x equals to 2 <coughs> maybe you want to add that this function is continuous everywhere else it's discontinuous only at 2. You have the polynomial features. So, oh, and by the way, this sketch that I have is terrible. It is not the way the function looks. I mean, if anything, I should do this at least because we have a positive slope, right? <coughs> the, the thing is that you have a quadratic function to the left of 2 and you have a linear function to the right of 2. Now, if they are to connect at the same point, the open circle and the black dot, if they are to connect, then you would have continuity. Since in this case they were disconnected, you have a limit does not exist which breaks the continuity at the point. <coughs> the next example would be a piecewise function called step function, which is your taxes. Yep, let's talk taxes. Remember guys, this is calculus course. It covers all aspects of your life. All of it.
Tax brackets. Very interesting to play this game with the IRS um, on trying to keep as much money that you earn yourself. <coughs> uh, as the laws get changed, the worst category to be in is this one. Uh, now we'll take a look at this because that's the easiest and I'm going to round to 10k 38k and so so I don't have to go and put everything down to a dollar <coughs> this over here is purchased by a gentleman who has to offload 50k a year so he doesn't have to, he doesn't get slammed on tax so you can imagine how much an interesting right? if he has to get rid of, of 50 k um, The game is played simple, right? You make certain money, you fall in a bracket, and that bracket is taxed at the percent on the side. Note the increase, which is amazing for middle class, of 10 to 15 to 25. Right? And then 3% up, and then 5, and then 2. Right? So it's obviously great to destroy you all the time, right? Because most of the people will be jumping this bracket here, right? Anyway, so <clears throat> a vast majority of people uh, would be taxed uh, here. Now, those who know how to donate, right, can save a lot of money because 15% on the difference and so on, and just it, go learn, it's, it's arithmetic, right? <coughs> Which is why donate, donating money is very important, right? Uh, it bumps you to a lower tax bracket, so you deduct some money off of your main income, but then you apply a smaller percent. I actually do a very interesting example in my uh, algebra class where I have Joe and Mark uh, work same job, and then I have one of the guys to work Saturdays as well. And then when you calculate the tax bracket, they make exactly the same amount of money at the end of the year, where one person worked just the full time 40 hours. The other one worked 40 hours plus four hours every Saturday at 50% higher salary, and all of that was eaten by taxes because it jumped the tax bracket. <laughs> it jumped the tax bracket for about 100 bucks. So, a <coughs> $200 donation would bring them down, saving 4000 But uh, again, uh, all of this is going to stay up to you to go and, and research because obviously the only thing the school will not teach you is how to deal with that and credit card, but you will learn all other things with garbage, including calculus. Um, so, this is what we call the piecewise function. Uh, and uh, it, 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 we call it also step function because it's a series of steps that will be built up. So the visual representation of, of this <coughs> would be, let's say this is 10K, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100K, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 200K, and that's still nowhere where uh, $82 billion are that Bill Gates sits on. So now uh, we're going to have our 10% and our 15% and our 25% and our 28% and our 33% and our 35%, right? So <coughs> uh, if you are making uh, up to 10K, well, 9,325, I'm just going to call that 10K. So if you're making up to 10K, the tax is 10%. So we are going to go and 
go up to 10k and put the open circle there uh, then at 10k to 38k which is here we are going to have the next piece and then the next step is to 92k so we start here and 92k is here that's the next one and then uh, from 91k to 191k uh, at 28% so that will be here to 91k here that's the next piece <coughs> the next one is starting at 33 but then we ran out of the x space and it's gonna go this way so there you go uh, now every time when you have any time when you have the uh, the jump that's where the discontinuity happens so every single one of these jumps here and here and here and here uh, they're all discontinuities note that the value exists it's the limit that fails to exist right because looking from the left and looking from the right they don't agree on a value therefore overall limit does not exist and it fails uh, line number two on our um, chart so this is a step function right uh, the x-axis is the money you earn and this is the percent of tax that you that you pay and we see these continuities <coughs> so now you make a dollar to the left or dollar to the right the point over here makes sure that you are in a higher tax bracket if you make that one dollar and um, and these are so these are tax brackets right and we are looking at discontinuities so that's another example of um, the use of this continuous function uh, to uh, something that everyone has to deal with right death and taxes yeah. now what are the three ways in which the function can fail to be continuous so we draw three graphs they're all x y and i am going to uh, put situations here so these are the three graphs with uh, obvious discontinuities now i would like to know which rule fails i'll write the rules rule number one f of a exists number two limit of f of x exists and number three number one equal to number two in the value so what fails on the first graph rule one rule two rule three okay. rule one fails right off the bat so rule one fails 
put the red X there. Rule one fails because this is your value A, and when you try to plug that into a function, it's just going to shoot through this hole and never bounce into Y the axis, so there's no value. So rule number one fails. How about the second picture? Rule number three fails. Very good. Rule number one passes. Because this is your f of a. It's defined. It exists. So, number one passes. Number two passes as well. The limit is whatever this value is. Right? You approach on the left, you approach on the right, you always get into this empty hole. So that's the limit. Limit exists. What fails is number three. Right? This is what it fails. Because the black dot and the open circle are not in the same spot. So that's why number three fails. How about the last graph? Do we have rule number one passing? Okay, I see some of you shaking yes. Why? Why is rule number one passing? Because um, the, one, the function on the left side, uh, there's always going to be a value because there's a, a closed circle above the, uh, the second. Yes, so you mean function on the right, not on the left. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this one. <coughs> that closed circle is a point that has a y value and uh, that's what you're looking for so when you're considering a first one is going to pass because it exists right there all right how about the second one limit does limit exist looking at the graph Yes, no, who cares? Let's go home. All of the above? <coughs> Does the limit exist? No. Approach from the left, you end up here on this elevation. Approach from the right, you end up on this elevation for y. That's not the same elevation. See over here? Approach on the left, approach on the y, you always stay on the same y. Over here, approach on the left, approach on the right, you stay on same y. <coughs> so number two passes on the first two graphs. On a third graph, it doesn't pass. The third graph is the graph where you have your edge of the table. And now, the experiment of continuity. No, it continues. It's done. Very simple. Experiment number two for continuity. Continues. Very simple, right? Question is, is there something that is going to ruin your day? That's what it is. <coughs> yes? No, I, I, no, I, I uh, drew this bad. Uh, I erased it by, by accident. This, it used to be like this, sorry. Yes. Ah, the deficiency of limits and calculus. See? Calculus in all of its power and all of its glory cannot detect a single little even tiny point right there 
because it calculates everywhere around it. All right? So calculus calculates the limit everywhere except there. So calculus is clueless that that thing is there. It's the pre-calc that tells you, hi, I'm here. <coughs> and now the continuity fails because pre-calc and calc do not agree. Yeah? Only when pre-calc and calc agree, you have continuity. If you have them disagree, then you don't have continuity. <coughs> Great. All of this so far to define continuity at a point. Next one is global continuity. Continuity for the entire function at every point. Not just one, but every point. Function f of x is globally continuous if it is continuous at every point of its domain. That's a lot of calculations. If you're going to go and prove that polynomial is globally continuous <coughs> by calculating continuity at each one of its points, yeah, there are infinitely many points, so good luck, right? For that purpose, we have the powerful life-saving theorem which states the following functions are continuous. And then there is a list. are globally continuous number one polynomials guys this involves a lot constant function like f of x equals five which is a horizontal line is in there linear line y equal mx plus b is in there quadratic and cubic and quadric and anything that you can think of x x to the 7 minus 13x it's in there right so polynomials all polynomials across the board are continuous globally which means everywhere between negative infinity and infinity number two <coughs> radical that's the square root and so i'm just gonna put nth root of f of x exponential logarithmic I'm singling out sine and cosine So all of these are globally continuous. <coughs> what is not continuous? Well, oh, uh, sorry. Uh, rational function. Provided denominator not equal to zero i actually have to give example for number six over here because people are used to seeing 
oh, it has denominators, so therefore they're going to be vertical asymptotes, they're, they're discontinued. No. X squared plus 1 can never be 0. No matter what you plug in. You can plug in a positive number, a negative number. Uh, you think of uh, whatever. Prime, non-prime, uh, even, ah, uh, whatever. Whatever you plug in, the square will kill the negative sign. And then you add 1. So the denominator can never reach 0. Therefore, this is continuous. You're going to go and draw this. Write the graph it on your graphing utility, and you're going to get a single line without interruptions. 1 over x is discontinuous at 0, but this function, that it's almost 1 over x. Do you see what happens if you ignore this 1? If you ignore this 1, x and x cancel, you get 1 over x, right? You put this plus 1 in, and you create a um, continuous function immediately. <coughs> so, all of the functions from the list are continuous on their global domain. Further, yes? I guess it's just curiosity. Are you just, like, imaginary numbers when it comes to limits? Uh, no, not in calculus. There are actually courses later on that will promote that. You'll see some, some more of it in uh, your differential equations. But um, there are dedicated courses to um, complex realm. So, yeah. All right, the next big point. How about we go with blue? The following function combinations of continuous functions are continuous. See, you have to have a continuous function as an input. Keep that in mind. So, continuous function is an input. So, that's why we say that combinations of continuous functions give continuous... Or, no, let's, let's go with the same wording. The following function combinations and compositions of continuous functions gives a continuous function. What do you have? Well, obviously, addition of two continuous function is going to give us continuous function. The subtraction as well, multiplication, division, given g not zero, right? Uh, and then you have f to some exponent. and uh, whatever root of that f. So they are all, all of them, are continuous. And then we have our function composition, which means f of g of x is f composed with, with g. <coughs> what you get from here will also be continuous. Now, fair warning, right? Let's jump into Calculus uh, 2 course. Let's say this one. And then we're going to jump into Integral Test. And then I'm going to take a look at the calculus 2 problem, which you don't have to understand at all, and say, 
if all of the conditions are met, you can perform interval test. Condition number one, continuity. Now, what does that mean? So this single problem in Calc 2, in this section that you do, you have to write the proof on continuity. And you will be calling on these theorems that I just used. An example. 1 over x squared on 2 to infinity. The question is, is it continuous? You see, that's a calculus 1 question. This is what you're learning now, and you are using it as a little snippet of Calc 2 problem later on that is 15 pages long. It's amazing for carpool tunnel and killing time. Okay. Um, is it continuous? Yes, because both 1 and x squared are continuous, because they're polynomials, and their quotient is continuous because the denominator is not equal to 0 on 2 to infinity. You see that? We are working on a chopped off domain. The one number that would make this explode, right? 1 over 0 is infinity. One number that would ruin your day is 0, but it's not in the domain because we are only focusing on 2 to infinity. So we call on those theorems. 1 and x squared are polynomials, therefore they are continuous. Combination of continuous functions is continuous, we are dividing f by g, and we are also proving that the denominator can't be zero. We just used <coughs> all of those, then you have to do two more proofs, and then you can finally do the problem and provide the answer in red. Welcome to Calc 2. Um, I think I did one more. There it is. Is the function 1 over <coughs> square root of x plus 8 continuous on 0 to infinity? Right? Continuous? Yes, it's continuous. Why? Because the denominator, the question is, can the denominator be 0? Well, the denominator is 0 if x is negative 8. x negative 8 is not in the domain. So, combination of all continuous functions <coughs> is a continuous function. Denominator cannot be zero, therefore continuous. This is how you do problems in calculus. You write paragraphs, then you have to show that it's positive and decreasing, and then you can do your problem. <coughs> Which is why I say, right, passing Calc 1 with C and going into Calc 2, can you do these proofs? Because they are just a part of the problem of your count two. So now let's take a look at f of x equals to e to the three x minus one divided by the square root of x squared plus four. Is this continuous? The answer is yes. And now is every good five-year-old, why? Well, let's go and look at it. Functions <coughs> e to the x, 3x, 1, x squared plus 4, and square root of x are all continuous by the theorem, by this theorem here. So the entire list of functions I listed there is continuous because they're all on this list. <coughs> now, why do I have these? Well, that's your function composition. So, you see that this and this is also separated, but over here is on a pile. So now we say function composition of continuous functions is continuous 
which actually builds us e to the 3x and square root of x squared plus 4. <coughs> now, quotient of two continuous functions is continuous provided denominator is not equal to zero. Well, since I have e to the 3x minus 1 over square root of x squared to the 4, right, as a function, all I need to show that this cannot be zero. <coughs> well, what do I do? I square both sides to kill the root. x squared plus 4 equals to 0. x squared equals to negative 4. x equals to plus minus 2i. Not real. Now this means that there are no real numbers that will make 0 in denominator. So, we prove that each individual function is uh, continuous because of the, definite, uh, the theorem. Then we also invoke the function composition, right, which is this puppy over here. It uh, will be featured on your first exam. So, function composition which allowed us to put these disconnected functions into a single function and also shows it's continuous and the same thing for this pair here and then once I build the numerator and denominator we place them there and just make sure the denominator is not zero ever because if it is that's the point of your discontinuity right away because remember every time denominator is zero you either have open circle or you have vertical asymptote they ruin your day E even equally right <coughs> so yes f of x is continuous on negative infinity to positive infinity piecewise continuity You already saw this, so I'm just going to put the example, the same example. 1 over x. Is globally discontinuous. At. X equal. Zero. But, the function has two continuous pieces. So, Looking at the piecewise continuity, 1 over x is continuous on negative infinity to 0, and you use the parenthesis to make sure you are not including 0. And 0 to infinity. So all excluded. You can't include zero in any of these, and obviously you can't uh, include infinities. You're not Chuck Norris. That word right there is continuous. One over x is continuous on. Yes. This over here is continuous. 
Kunt. So this is your piecewise continuity. <coughs> the calculus 2 example, which I showed earlier, had 1 over x on a domain 2 to infinity, including 2. So if you are to graph this thing, and I'll graph it blue, this is your standard 1 over x. You chop it at 2, and you are only looking at this piece here. Well, that's perfectly continuous. You throw everything else to the garbage as soon as you get the domain. So this is piecewise continuous. Holy nightmare, did I forget to put... Oh no, I put it. For a moment, I I, I thought I, I missed this one. So, continuity at the point, global continuity, piecewise continuity, discontinuity. Right? So, those are all the players that we have to look at as we move along. Yeah. So this breaking apart of terms when it comes to a limit, that's applicable only to limits. Like that won't apply in like algebra or other stuff. You know what uh, I'm talking about? No. Like you know how you can like you can take like the, the major equation of the limit, like E three X minus one and okay. you can, like, break it up by term to like Oh yeah. Uh, find yes. That that doesn't work anywhere else. No. Okay, it's just limits. Because limits can apply to each individual one, right? Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> because of the rules of, of limits. Uh, the book in its infinite wisdom is listing also somehow tangent as a continuous function and some other functions. And I'm just not going to look at that because I get brain aneurysm every time I do. Uh, Sines and cosines are the only trig functions that do not have vertical asymptotes. Right? Tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant all have vertical asymptotes. Therefore, they're all discontinuous. Or you can say piecewise continuous, right? If you want to be politically correct in mathematics. Uh, you know, the glass half empty, half full, which is a lie because glass is always full of air. So there's that. Uh, now it's appropriate to talk about uh, the way to graph these trigonometric functions by hand, primarily secant and tangent. Those are the ones that you need to know. And I already talked about the inverse tangent, which is something else that you have to know at all times. So let's do some pre-calc 2, which will tie with our continuity. <coughs> Graph y equal secant x. So... We have the um, secant, we understand secant x as 1 over cosine x. Now, you better know that, otherwise you are doomed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to graph the cosine, and then I'm going to flip the cosine out into a secant. So, let's start with our cosine. Cosine starts at 1 and then falls 
into negative 1 and then rises up back to 1. This black line over here is your cosine x. Now, what I'm going to do is remember what I have. I need the 1 over cosine. Anytime when cosine goes through the uh, x-axis, its y value is 0 and you are getting 1 over 0. You are creating a vertical asymptote. One more time. Every time when the value of cosine uh, when when value of the cosine x is 0, you are creating 0 in denominator, and you have 1 over 0, which creates vertical asymptote. So to graph the secant, all I need to do is to draw vertical asymptotes through the points where the cosine cuts through x-axis. Now... I take scissors, I cut along, along the x-axis and I just flip it out. So what is the graph that we are looking for? It is this. And then you remove your cosine. That's the boss way to do this. So if you are supposed to graph 2 secant x minus pi over 3, you will graph 2 cosine of x minus pi over 3. And then you will just flip it out when you are done with graphing an easy one, which is cosine. I'm going to put the, the cosine back as this dashed. That's the cosine, and the red one is the secant x. So this is how you graph those other trig functions. You know what they are, so now you can go and practice co cosecant, because that's 1 over sine. And uh, you, can, you can do that on your own. The last uh, concept is uh, the intermediate value theorem in this lecture. Uh, this is going to be on your lab, so you'll need this. And I'm just horrified that no one reacted on the garbage which I just said. Did you notice what I said? The intermediate value theorem is going to be on your lab, so you need it. Think of that statement. Like, who cares? Right? You're not going to learn something so that you can do it on a lab and just, yeah, whatever. It's not a reason why we're here. So pay attention to those things. Anyway, um, guys, in intermediate value theorem is uh, actually the underlying thing that we never use uh, to solve every equation that exists in the galaxy. Uh, all of our technology and everything we have is driven by the, the science, which starts with math and then goes into physics and then goes into engineering and then goes into whatever device you're, you're having or, or a bridge or whatever it is. It starts with math and then goes to physics and then goes to engineering. <coughs> Therefore, the most fundamental building block of everything we have as a species is an equation. And intermediate value theorem um, tells us on how to uh, figure out and solve equations. Now, we don't use this method, but if you ever find yourself bored, by all means. 
So let's write the theorem down. <coughs> Suppose f of x is continuous on closed interval a, b, meaning endpoints are included. And L is the number strictly between f of a and f of b, then there exists at least one number C and A B satisfying F of C equals L. I don't know if these words mean anything to you. Uh, read it 5,000 times and eventually it will sink in. Let's draw a graph and understand the statement. So, what I have is a continuous function from A to B. Now, if you trace these guys back this is your f of a and this is your f of b because b produces f of b and a produces f of a <coughs> so now they say if the function is continuous well there it is and you have a number l strictly between f of a and f of b that means that l is the y value pick that l anywhere here the theorem says there is a value x equals c which makes that l we can trace this back and actually find that c Guys, when you are solving equations, what is your answer? It's x equals 2, right? x equals 7, x equals 1 half, x equals c. See that? The entire achievement of our civilization, without exaggeration, right, lies in here. Because everything starts with solving equations. Before algebra and banking in Renaissance, civilization on this planet used to bang rocks to make fire. All right? <coughs> so now when you look at this, what you do is you just bring this stuff down and you redraw this problem so that your value that you are looking for is on x-axis. <coughs> now if you look at your a and f of a and b and f of b look at that 
if there is a solution to the equation and that solution is between A and B you are guaranteed to have F of A and F of B to be opposite sign. One always has to be above, one always has to be below. X axis. <coughs> See that? A is producing F of A. F of A is less than zero, it's negative. Right? Because X B produces F of B bigger than zero. So the solution to the equation, equation equal to zero, C is guaranteed to be uh, between A and B as long as these guys have opposite signs. You always be trapped between them. Always. Uh, this is the theory behind solving equations. And uh, I discovered uh, what, 16 or 17 years, 16 years ago, I discovered 16 years ago a terrible truth in uh, how poor education in mathematics here is on the high school level. None of the students I talked to when I became a tutor downstairs knew that the main way of solving equations is graphing. And then algebraic ways are convenience when it's possible. That's not a widely known fact in education in this country. And I don't know why. Here is an example. If you want to solve an equation x plus 2 equals to 5, everyone knows what to do. What do you do? You subtract 2 on both sides. I already heard it. Right? But that's a convenience. Yay that we can do that and solve this problem like that. Now let me pose a different problem. e to the x plus 2 equals x minus 3. What now? Aha. Uh -huh. There is nothing that you can do algebraically to solve this. Because you will say, oh, subtract 2, easy. Yeah. Now what? Ln both sides, it will kill E. Sure, I agree. Ln both sides, x equals ln of x minus 5. What now? Well, if you E both sides, you're going to kill ln. Sure, but you resurrected E to the x on the other side. There is no way, comma, in hell, comma, to do this algebraically. The only way you can do it is... You graph a function on the left, you graph the function on the right. If they intersect, that's your answer. Or move, so this is garbage over here, so just erase that. <coughs> or if you move everything to the same side, equal to zero, graph this somehow, and we're going to learn in chapter four how to graph this and then see if it cuts the x-axis to find the value. So what is the way to solve problems? I'll come back to this, to solve equation. Graphically, what I have here are two functions. I have a linear function, x plus two. Well, that goes, y-intercept is two. And then we have a 45 degree going forever. This is your left-hand side, x plus 2. Then, 3, 4, 5, you graph the other equation, which is y equals to 5. Look where they intersect. They intersect right there. 
And what is the x coordinate of that intersection? It's the 3 that you want. x equals 3. 100% of equations that exist are solved this way. And then some, you are lucky to have some algebra voodoo that you can perform to come up with x equals 3 without doing the graph. Now, as I said, you have your e to the x minus 2 equal to x plus 3. <coughs> the only way to, to solve that is to do the graph. There is no uh, other way for, uh, for this. So you will draw these two functions, and then depending on how precise your instruments are and you know, the amount of OCD you possess uh, will determine the quality of the answer you have. So I have x plus 3, linear line, that will go forever like this, that's x plus 3. And then I have e to the x minus 2. Well, e to the x minus 2, my asymptote drops down. So the exponential function will go like this and then through 1 and shoot up. Here is the one solution and another solution. Whatever these values are over here, x equals a is a solution and x equals b is a solution. <coughs> so this has two solutions. Now, we are lucky that we live in a time where you can actually stop this into computer and get a 16-digit precision if you want to. Not that you need it, <laughs> right? Because we don't machine anything to that precision anyway. But, right, in the good old days, you had to bleed for hours to come up with these irrational numbers that are answers in this particular case. So now you see how continuity plays a huge role here. In order for us to have technology, we have to have mathematical structure through equations and continuity to actually build these things. And anytime when is this discontinuity, well, discontinu right? discontinuity, when you push the switch over there, no more lights. What did you do? You interrupted the flow of electrons through the, through the wire. You introduced the discontinuity. So it's a very important lecture. And uh, this last part, obviously, uh, is theoretical just to make you appreciate that continuity as the concept uh, which is linked to the most important thing that we actually have as a species, and that is equations. Now, I don't care whether you're talking equations for economics and, uh, you know, uh, engineering or <coughs> every discipline has equations. Yes? What if you have to, like, graph an equation with more than three variables? Oh, that's called three. Yes. So, um, these are only two Ds. Yeah. Um, in, uh, when you start talking about uh, 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 three-dimensional shapes, you are talking about calculus three. Mm -hmm. And in that case, you are going to have uh, intersection of planes to design this, this this tablet, right? Because the angles in between, I will be teaching this uh, uh, next week with a normal vector here, a normal vector here, and what ad, uh, angle they meet at is the angle they meet here, and so on, uh, to design the angles, right? A plane. Design this room. You have a z equals 0, z equals 10, z, uh, x equals 0, x equals, uh, I believe, 34 y equals 0, y equals 28, I believe, we calculated in this classroom. I can actually look it up. Is there like a limit to the amount of <coughs> you can calculate? No. Since there's like just three-dimensional space? Well, three-dimensional space plus dimension of time, and then I will say plus dimension of temperature, plus dimension of, uh, of uh, density, plus dimension of, right? Okay. So, uh, simply, dimension is a variable that you that you say lowercase t for time, capital T for temperature, and then you are figuring out. So in Calculus 3, we are going to deal with a four-dimensional um, function because you are going to have three dimensions in space.
to describe an object and then you can have a density or temperature or something and then you have the the 4d right because three dimensions of space and temperature so so um the the weather models i believe is 22 variable model because you have and it's the, the couple differential equations mm -hmm. that are grinded by the computer off of the continuous input. Mm -hmm. Those little stations that you drive by on the road with a little solar panel and a little box and a little thing that spins or that sock, right? Uh, that collects the data that feeds to the to the mothership computer, right? And uh, what they do is they, they lay the grid on the county and each grid has one of those stations. Mm -hmm. They feed the temperature, pressure, right 22 variables i don't know what they are but 22 different variables so there's like no limit to <coughs> try to no try to okay. you you can you know if you have 170 variables good luck with making sense of it but let's put that in perspective right now i know i'm killing it but you know this one this is the website that that traces airplanes in real time this is North America <coughs> I would call that more than one variable input right uh, each one of these planes has its three-dimensional position in times times the number of airplanes which is right here which is 15,706 flying you think that there is Joe somewhere in a control tower drawing triangles and trying to figure out no as a computer science person you're gonna sit and figure out the algorithm to make the sense out of this and then the AI is going to spit out um, the landing and departure times and so on. And then people get upset. Like, My flight is 30 minutes long. I mean, 30 minutes late. <laughs> you think you're gonna do better than these people? Please, by all means, see if we keep one plane out of all these 15,000 flying after you're done with re your major redesign so everyone is on time. So, how ridiculous the people are. My right, self-entitled. <coughs> oh, suck. Really? Don't make a better one. What? I think you're so critical about things. You think you're so awesome. Every time you think something is terrible, please make it better. Right? anytime so yeah that's um, that's that <coughs> uh, well that's the lecture bye right <laughs>